Hi there, this is JTech, welcoming you to this seventh installment of my series of educational music production videos for Sonic Academy. Today I'm going to show you uh, three quick mix tips. Uh, these are techniques that I use in pretty much every single mix that I do, uh, and they're just a few more ways to ensure that uh, your track is actually ready to rumble before you release it. Uh, so the first one I want to show you is basically uh, the concept of putting a low pass filter on the master and just sucking it down to just those low bass frequencies uh, and actually listening to put it, putting the sub bass and the bass frequencies under a microscope. Uh, the purpose of this is to ensure that your kick and, and bass are sort of playing off each other nicely. And the other benefit that this brings is it'll allow you to see if there are any instruments that should be further up in the high frequencies coming down and muddying up the bass. So let's have a listen to how this, this groove section sounds with just the sub bass. So just sort of having a listen to what we can hear there, there's the kick and the sub obviously. You can hear these little uh, bass snarls, bass stab things coming through just in the sub frequencies, which I am totally okay with because they are bass instruments. Something I'm not so sure I want to be hearing in this frequency range is these ARP sounds. So in this particular scenario what I would do is just high pass those ever so slightly just to allow a little bit more space for that bass. Now this is also an excellent time to play around with the, the volume levels on your kick and, and bass to make sure that they're sitting right. At the moment I'd say they're actually pretty good, but I'll just give you a listen to how it sounds if say the kick is too loud. Or if the bass is too loud. And uh, what you're trying to go for here is what I call the green room effect. That is, you've finished your DJ gig and uh, the next DJ is playing now and you're taking a load off in the green room, you're sitting back with a Heineken and uh, all you can hear through the walls of the green room in, in the safety of your green room is, is the bass. Uh, and this is actually really important because that low end of the spectrum is not necessarily so noticeable on laptop speakers or on your home system, but when you're in the club, it's what's shaking everybody. If it's too powerful, then you definitely want to know about it, and this is a way to do it. And so we can sort of sweep up the frequency, spe frequency spectrum a little bit. And hear how things come in as we go up. So, just going back down to around sort of maybe 150, 160 hertz. Something that I can hear that I don't really want to be hearing down here is some low end on these additional parts that I added. This synth group is okay. There's not very much of that coming through. This however, there's a lot of uh, sort of sub bass in there, which doesn't need to be there because this particular stack of sounds, the, the synths and the, uh, the extra elements that I added, don't really need to be doing anything in the sub bass. And so what you're trying to do here is basically clear up as much room in the lower end of the spectrum for just the most important bass sounds. So I've put a, a high pass filter there on that entire section, I just grouped them up. So now there's a little bit more separation between all of the bass elements and everything, everything else that's going on in the track. So the next thing I wanted to show you is uh, basically just a trick that I use whenever I make EQ adjustments in a final mix. Uh, I also use it for volume adjustments. Um, so the best way to hear what you actually need to do with a, uh, with a, a particular track in a mix is, is to sort of really identify what it's bringing to the mix or what it's taking away from the overall sound space. And so the way that I do this is basically just switch things off on a particular track and then have a listen to the mix and just get used to listening to the mix, how it sounds without that one part in there. Once my ears have acclimatized, I then bring the track back in.
And uh, what that does is it really allows you to, to get a feel for how the sound space was to begin with and then how it sounds uh, when this particular sound is added in. I'll try it with a hi-hat. With, with the snare. So what happened there is uh, I got used to this kind of nice uh, sort of clean sound that the whole mix had um, when it was just those claps and without the snare. And then when I brought that snare in, I suddenly felt like there was this low frequency down here that was just adding a certain some, certain kind of uh, like uh, a frequency that I wasn't too keen on. And so I pulled it out. And so it was... It was that. And because I had sort of acclimatized my ears to the mix without this sound in there at all, when I brought that sound back in, it became immediately more apparent what the problem frequencies were. So that's a really good way to sort of identify those. The last thing I'd recommend to everybody is to, is to uh, always give your mix a bit of airtime in mono. It sounds gross. I've got a, a mono audit utility on the, uh, on the master here, but it's what people are generally going to be hearing when you're listening on a nightclub sound system, which still blows my mind if you if you think about the fact that that is what's actually coming out of the speakers when you're in a nightclub. You know, it's uh, it's kind of interesting. You know, unless you've got like a really really uh, well produced uh, sort of show with a big sound system that's you know in a really great venue, which might be stereo. Then generally mono is what people will be listening to. And the good thing about mono is uh, it gives you a really good picture of what your mix is going to sound like when it's coming from one particular sound source, especially if it's something like, say, an iPod dock speaker, something like that, or if it's um, being played in a restaurant or something like that where you're not necessarily like being placed between the two speakers. Uh, it gives you a really good idea of how things are. So uh, say with this mono switch on, for example, what I would listen for is other levels of the, of the, of the sub bass, the kick, are they, are they still working in mono? I would even go as far as to say that sub bass might be a little too loud now listening to it in mono. And it's always a very gratifying experience switching back to stereo after uh, after working in mono for a while. What you do need to be aware of sometimes is that if you mix too long in mono, uh, sometimes the spatial effects can be overly pronounced, some of the stuff that exists purely in the stereo field. So it's good to switch back and forth every now and then just to, uh, just to make sure that that's all working properly. In the next video, I'm going to show you how to use the LCR, left, center, right panning technique, to add a little bit of spice and fun to your mixes. So stay tuned for that. Thanks everybody for watching, commenting and indeed liking. We really do appreciate all the support we get here on our Sonic Academy YouTube channel. So if you find this video super useful, please, we'd love you to hit the subscribe button. We update the uh, YouTube channel every week with new content. And if you want to watch some more relevant content, just click on the videos beside me.